So to get back to fly fishing, you know, what's different? You know, if you've been spin fishing, when you guys already fly fished, have you, you fly fished? No, I haven't. And you have as well? No, no. You have, okay. All right. So, you know, no bait, right? <laughs> There's no bait in fly fishing. Although, I, I took my, my, uh, my fiance's son fishing down at Lake Ann, and we went down there and we fly fished for about four or five hours. I taught him how to fly fish. We didn't catch jack. And, and the poor guy wanted to catch a fish, so when he finally stopped, he got some worms and put a hook under one of his bobbers and started catching catfish like crazy with the fly rods. So if you have to use bait, worst case, you can. But what you're doing is you're throwing the line, right? You're throwing these near weightless flies. It's totally different than spinning gear. And so just to give you an idea, we go outside after we get done. But just to give you an idea, um, it, you know, it, it's literally, um, how do, you, how do you throw this piece of heavy line with a weightless fly on it? And, and it's literally a, just a motion where you're casting it and you're doing a loop and you're letting more line out. And, and you know, that's far enough right there to catch a decent fish, right? And you go, you know, you get people who can go 120 feet, um, you know, with a fly line and cast. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Um, but, uh, you know, if you go 30 feet, you're good. Almost everywhere. Bonefish, you maybe have to go 40, 50. And, uh, and if you're out with a guy in the, in the Keys, you know, the wind's usually blowing 25 miles an hour, which really complicates it. So it gets fairly, uh, fairly intense if you don't practice when you, uh, when you get there. But the nice thing is, you know, unlike bait fishing, you know, you're fly fishing, it's, you something happen all the time. If you're kind of ADHD like I am, you, you know, you're always something to keep you busy, right? You change flies, you're not catching anything, you can change lines. You go from a floating one to a sinking one, you go a different size. And so there's always something to change. And, and you know, despite, you know, everything you see, it's not that hard to learn, right? And you can learn in an hour, and then you can perfect it for a, uh, the rest of your life. So these, these are the basics. So just, just to give you an idea. Um, so this is a fly rod. It's all, this is a, uh, an Orvis, uh, one of the only Orvis ones I have. Uh, they're very expensive. This was a gift. So the, the other thing that's changed is most of the fly rods used to be really expensive, six, seven hundred dollars a piece, right? Now they dropped to where you can get really good fly rods for two hundred dollars, and they still have lifetime guarantees and they can break them. So this is this is a three weight, you know, really light, you know, good for panfish, good for trout out in the little streams, and uh, and basically the, the main thing you, you need to worry about is you've got your rod um, with a very you know very flexible tip. You've got this heavy line that you're going to throw, and then you've got a, a uh, the actual piece out here where the fly goes. So you get a leader that's going to typically start out with a, a butt section that's pretty, pretty heavy, and then another section that's medium sized, and then a, and then a thin section at the end, which is where you're going to tie your fly. And you can tie it, and I'll show you some knots as well. Um, and then you know you can change things around, or so you could add a. You know, we could add an uh, indicator if we're going to fish sinking flies. Um, you know, we could add different different types of poppers and those kind of things. And, uh, you know, so lots of variations. And then behind the fly line, the fly line is about 75 feet. Behind the fly line on most reels, you have what's called a backing line. And that's another 100 yards of, uh, of lightweight line that if, if you get a big fish and it runs, you still got plenty of line. And... Uh, you know, if you, if you get something that's really amazing, you can actually lose all your line. You know, and that's happened to me once. So I was out fishing in the Deschutes out in Oregon in July, and I was using this rod, which is a five weight, uh, which is really just for trout. You know, and, and except in the Deschutes, you get these fish called the steel, which I showed you earlier. Except they don't usually show up till after the 15th of August. But somehow I was out there in July, I'm fishing for trout. And literally in an hour, I hooked five steelhead on my five-foot line. And one of them, one of them, they, and they're just, and they're right in from the ocean. So the fish come in when they first come in from the ocean, they're this chrome color, and they eventually change back to a full color of a trout. But when they're chrome, they're about three times more strong and more explosive. So I literally had to grab my fly, you know, I felt them, I, you know, I saw them for a second. And then he pointed downstream and he started heading for the Pacific, which was about 100 miles away. And uh, he literally took every bit of line off my reel. 
uh, all the fly line and all the backing, and then literally just poop, and the fly popped. And I'm standing there with everything laying down the river to about 150 yards. And it's like, ooh, that was exciting. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that was, uh, that was pretty amazing. A little adrenaline. So, and then, you know, I mean, again, I'll move outside and cast a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, this is the, uh, the key. The, one of the key things, though, is test your knots. There's nothing worse than, you know, you, you, know, you do everything right, you cast, you, you're fighting a fish, and suddenly it's gone, and, you can, and it comes in, and there's this little squiggly thing at the end of your line. And what it means is your fly, you know, your knot slipped and came off, right? And you're just sitting there like, oh, that work, and here's, you know, here's this, ah, it's like, what an idiot. So, not, uh, not good stuff. And then, and then these are some of the basic knots. So, you know, in, in, you know, in, in, you go to a fly fishing school, and they'll sit there and make you tie the knots, and, you know, there's all this mystique about this one's better than that one. I, I, went, I spent the, um, I don't know if you remember the week we had the big recession show up, and I had scheduled a trip to the Bahamas, and uh, so I was the only guy on this island. Uh, there's there literally the people that lived on the island, I showed up, and at this fishing lodge, and I was the only one there for the whole week, except there was one English guy who lived there, and he was a knot fanatic. And he would sit there, for, and there was nothing to do. Once you finish fishing eight hours, you go back to the lodge, it's like, okay, there's no TV, there's no internet, there's no nothing, except a little bit of electricity. And so you had to sit in the lodge, and this one guy was just sitting there, you know, talking about knots for like a couple hours a night. And I was like, oh my God, but you know, it was very, very interesting. I didn't really remember much of it. But I started drinking right there you know, once he started doing it. But this is, this is one where if, when you want to take and attach your uh, backing to your fly line or you want to attach your, um, your leader to the fly line, you can use a nail knot. Now, a lot of people use um, inner, inner loop loops, right? So a loop on the end of the fly line, a loop on the end of the leader, you just do a loop a loop-to-loop -loop connector, which is really easy. But for, for knots, people do a lot of those as well. And then this, this is the one that all the guides know how to tie it. It, it takes me 45 minutes to tie one of these. Mm -hmm. So I, don't, I never do it myself. I know how, in theory, and, you know, if, and if I did enough time, I could do one. But it's really hard. And it works really well. It looks really nice when you do it just right. But, uh, and there's a website there where you go practice. And then this is one I've been using a lot. So this is this is one where if you're going to, uh, you know, just, just to give you an idea, it's it's a um, it's great when you're fishing a streamer. So basically, all you do is you you know you tie this, and then you, then you're literally feeding it through there. and around and back through. And you end up with a great, you know, great loop, and the fly really swings freely at the end of that loop. Oh. So if you're fishing a streamer, it gives it a lot. If you tie a really tight knot, like a clinch knot or the improved clinch knot, um, you know, it ties it really tight to the fly, which is fine on a popper and stuff like that. But if you're if you're doing a streamer, it's much better if it wiggles around more. So doing a loop and letting it feed off a loop. Will, uh, will end up working out really, uh, you know, really well. But you said mostly just streamers, though, right? Yeah. Because I mean, it sometimes poppers. Yeah, I, mean, I was going to say because most smaller stuff, it, it seems like it almost be too visible. It depends on the fish. Yeah. I mean, you know, trout are very finicky, yeah. whereas bass could care less. Yeah. Right. You know, the bass, you know, the bass, it's like, oh, the fly's got four things of weed on it, it's yeah. got three knots, and they're like, great, I'm still going to eat it. It's shiny right? all year. <laughs> and then, you know, things like panfish could care less. Yeah. They just, you know, they're just like, well, I'll eat anything you <laughs> throw up. And then, you know, then this is the casting motion. We, and we can go outside and cast a little bit. But the, but the key is, you know, it's, it's, it's 11 and 2, right, back and forth, and you're not using your wrist. I mean, one of the worst things you can do when you get started is you start doing it with your wrist, right? Your arm stays still, and you're trying to do it this way. Looks good for the first 15 feet. You know, it's like, yeah, this feels good. I can do it, it, it except it doesn't work. So what you're, what you're really looking to do is do a, a motion where you're moving your, your entire forearm back and forth, and you're not breaking your wrist. 
and, and when we go outside, we, we can, uh, you know, we can show you the difference between the two. So that that's probably the the one. Uh, my my fiance just took. A, I I tried to teach her, but what you find out is you can never teach your significant other things. So she took a class with a woman guy at the fly fishing show, and and so she came up with this thing of uh, like. You know, answering a phone and then handing it to somebody else, right? It's like, oh, hello? Okay, here. And you, you're, you're just moving the rod back and forth. And so she came home, she, you know, she's like, wow, that woman was way better than you teaching me how to cast. Like, All right, we'll see you next time we go out <laughs> if it works. Um, but this is, this is, and then, you know, what you're doing is, again, you're using, the, you're using the rod to drive the line. The fly doesn't play any role whatsoever. It's all in the tip. The tip of the rod is driving everything. And it's, it's that weight of the line that, that lets you go. Uh, that will let you go. And you know, it, it, it works, you know, it works the same whether you're using this is a little three weight, but the rods go all the way up to a 12 weight or even a 14 weight if you're fishing for the, the marlin that we saw. And it's still the same motion. Right? And uh, and some of the rods are actually, I have one, one rod now, it's an 11 foot long, so it's, a, it's called a switch rod. And so there's a rod that you can do two hand casting with called a spray rod, it's really popular, especially out west. You see some of it here. But you do a two handed cast where you actually throw it, you can throw it a long ways, but they have a, a rod in between the regular rods and those spray rods called a switch rod, and you can cast it overhead or you can cast it two handed both. And they're about 11 feet long really handy and, uh, and, and really quite nice. So, you know, on the casting problems, you know, mostly the wrist, same, and also dropping the rod too far one way or the other, right? If you drop it too far, the, you know, the, the fly falls in the water behind you, it's stuck on a tree. Once in a while, if you cast it behind you, it falls in, you actually will hook a fish. So when I was in Brazil, uh, we had a guy who was looking at a fly fish, and he, he cast it, and he let it fall in the water behind him, and a couple times, he, he went, to, you know, went to throw the line and he had a fish back there. So it was quite, uh, you know, quite exciting. So, and the speed of the line is important. So you want to get, you know, it's, it's, a, you know, it's the speed and the momentum that's making everything happen. So that's the, uh, that's the key. And then the timing is always, uh, always tough. And the nice thing about, about fly fishing versus golf is even a bad cast can catch a great fish, right? You know, I played golf for like three and a half years, tried to get good, finally went back to fishing, and uh, I've been, been very happy with it this week. Um, so. And then, you know, if you want to make your own flies, you can certainly do that. Um, you know, and there are people that, that, that hardly fish, they spend most of their time making flies. So you, you can, you know, spend the whole winter making the flies and then go out and catch a fish in the summer with the, uh, the stuff that you made. Um, Kind of stuff, and then you know, if, if you, you know, getting started, we we are doing fishing classes every Sunday at Fort Belvoir, starting in April, going to October. Right, April. once a month on one, Sundays. Once a month on Sundays, so right right down by the archery range. So we've got gear, we've got boats, we've got people to show you how to do it. So you know, it's easy. Bring your kids along. Another good thing is to hire a guy. You take get a guy. He takes you out for the day. He brings all the stuff, he brings lunch, he shows you how to do it, he knows exactly where the fish are, you know, it's fantastic. We, we, I did a, when my, my uh, fiance was first learning how to fly fish, we did a float on the uh, Shenandoah River, so we had this guy Colby from um, Mossy Creek Fly Fishing. Took us out for the day, you know, we had a raft, you know, she sat in the front, I sat in the back, he worked with her on casting, she switched back and forth to spinning gear of fly fishing as she got tired. But, you know, we probably caught 30, 40 uh, smallmouth bass for the whole day. And just, you know, except for one rainstorm, which was about an inch of rain, 20 minutes, you know, um, you know, we just get fished all day and had a great, uh, great time. And then, you know, go out and then do it in the lawn. Borrow a rod, you know, go buy an inexpensive rod at the flea market and just go out on the, on the grass and practice. And, M uh, the MWR down oh, right. by the uh, fishing pier rents fly rods if you don't have one. Oh, they do rent fly rods. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. And then these are some different, you know, different resources. If you go on YouTube, 
you know, 20, 30 years ago, buying a book on fly casting stuff would be very expensive. Now, you, you can get 300 different fly fishing instructors on YouTube. Uh, you know, you can find it there. There's some, the, uh, this group, the Tidal Potomac Fly Rod Group, is fantastic for the local area. So if you have any questions about fishing or fly fishing in the local area, this is the group to sign up. It is, they, it, it's, this thing comes out every day. You know, there's probably five to six hundred people that will post, you know, different questions. People find people to fish with. There's shad reports on the Potomac. Uh, there's, you know, different rules, regulations. They, they did a big fly tie for uh, Project Healing Waters. So it, it's really good. If you just Google kind of some of the fly fishers, you know, you'll find it. And then our, our website is always updated with uh, new events that we're having. Um, you know, the, the movie, A River Runs Through, it's great to watch. It, it gets your blood pumping in terms of learning how to fly fish. And then, uh, on the right, if you get the right channel on Comcast, there's a show called The Fly Fishing Chronicles. And it's a guy in West Virginia named Curtis Fleming. And every week, he'll have a new show where he's either out fly fishing up at uh, Harper's Ferry. He had the uh, West Virginia, Miss West Virginia in his boat, and she'd never fly fished before. So they had her and a pair of shorts and a t-shirt fly fishing for striped for smallmouth bass with Curtis Fleming. But he also does the Project Healing Waters uh, uh, fly competition out at Rose River Farms, which is over by uh, the Shenandoah. And he's done, he does a whole bunch of other West Virginia fishing. So there's, there's a lot of different things around here to see. And he, he always has some great stuff on his, um, on his show. So, and then if you get really aggressive, so I'm actually involved in one of the companies I work with is a company called um, Bucket Dreams. And uh, it's just getting, it's launched, sort of half launched. You can find it if you really look for it. But as part of that, I actually wrote a business plan to do uh, a fishing bucket list around the world. So I put mine together for the next uh, what is it, 14 years, right? So you'll see there's quite a variety of places you can go um, to, uh, to go fly fishing and, and lots of different ways to do it. So I, I've actually fished in uh, New Zealand, Australia. I fished in the Cook Islands. I've been down to South America. I fished all over the U.S. I went to Alaska a couple of years ago. Um, still in a lot of other places I want to. I've been to the Bahamas a couple of times, and uh, Caribbean, and uh, I don't know where else. But, uh, lots of places to go. South America and saltwater, Belize, uh, Costa Rica is fantastic. Um, all you know, a lot of other places. Uh, British Columbia. Is, a, is another fantastic place to know. They got some great sea fishing out there. Um, I'm actually planning a trip in 2015 to uh, South America. So, and uh, Tierra del Fuego is on the absolute tip of South America. So it's like you can't go any further south. And the, the um, what you catch there are uh, somewhere between 20 and 30 pound sea run brown trout. So this is the uh, the sea run issue is trout are actually can actually go from saltwater, freshwater, and back. That's a steelhead is a rainbow trout that was born in freshwater, migrated out to the ocean, stayed there for a couple of years, then came back to spawn. But unlike salmon, they don't die, so they can actually come back and spawn two or three or sometimes even four times. Well, in Tierra del Fuego, they have brown trout that do the same thing. They're born in freshwater, they migrate out, and they come back and they'll do it two or three times. And the biggest ones will get up to like 30, 35 pounds. So just amazing fish. I mean, I don't know if I got a picture of them here. Let's see. But, um, but this, this is just a few different pictures. This was the 100-pound um, the tarpon. So this is the best fish that ever got away. Um, so I was fishing in Key West, and, uh, and, and literally, I, I, I never hooked a tarpon. I mean, I tried a bunch of times, and you know, casting is hard, it was windy or whatever. And we were fishing blind, and I said to the guy, I go, well, how will I know when I get one? He goes, you'll know. <laughs> and literally, I'm using a 12-weight fly rod, which is, you know, probably, you know, almost like a, like a broomstick, and with a really big reel. And, uh, you know, and we cast, and we let it sink, and then start stripping back. And it's still a pretty small fly. I mean, it's one, it's one of these. Um, So it's, it's a fly that's not that huge, right? So you cast it, and it's a floating line, and, uh, and literally, at a certain point, the fly stopped. 
and then you knew there was nothing there it could get hooked up on, so you have to strike. And and we maybe we spend a minute on that. So there's, when you fish, when you're when you're fishing in fresh water, right, and a fish grabs a fly, what you'll do is you'll lift up, right, just like with a spinning rod, and you'll set the hook. When you're when you're saltwater fishing, and you're stripping, and you get a you get a strike, you actually set the hook this way. You do what's called a strip strike. And, if, and sometimes it's very hard to make the shift, right? You're so used to lifting up. But the saltwater fish mouths are so bony and so hard that a lot of times lifting up this way, you won't set the hook. You know, you'll either pull it out of the mouths or you'll sort of set it and they'll run and it'll fall right out. So literally you have to pull this way and strip set. And, and, and you're, you're really just yanking with all, you know, sometimes you're using 20 and 30 pound leader on the fly. So you can just pull as hard as you possibly can straight with the rod to the fish. And that's how you set the hook in, uh, in salt water. So I, I, I tried to do that here. And the, we had him on for like 20 minutes. He jumped three, four times, you know, two, three, four feet out of the water, twirls over, and then finally the last time he went, and that, that big hole was him going away. So, but well worthwhile. This is a uh, the one up on the upper, uh, upper uh, side, the guy with the blue shirt. That's a, that's a 20 pound peacock bass. That was our last day in the Amazon. Mine was about that much smaller, and uh, and you know it was really good. These are steelhead out of the Deschutes River. Um, this is the Deschutes River. It runs through a canyon, and one of the things you run into is what are called tailwaters. So ta uh, tailwaters are, uh, are rivers where they're dam controlled. So you've got a dam, and then you got water, and then because the dam is there, you don't typically get you know the river doesn't usually blow out with mud. The, the waters are fairly consistent level. And the fishing can be really consistent. So if you go out to the Bighorn River in Montana, it's a tailwater. Uh, there's a river over in uh, western uh, Virginia that's a tailwater. Um, so the Deschutes happens to be a 120-mile tailwater because it runs all the way from Bend, Oregon, all the way to the Columbia River, um, you know, really long distance. But these are both wild. These are both steelhead. Um, I think they're both wild. But uh, you know, both caught on fly rods. Great river. Um, this, the, this, this was what my hand looked like after I got done with the peacock bass. So we literally had to tape it up with duct tape to keep the, because uh, I just, just grooves ripped into my fingers from the, uh, the fish running. And uh, here's a little Deschutes rainbow, and that's a, a Puget Sound salmon. So a friend of mine's, I think his son weighed 18 pounds when he took that picture. And, uh, and then this is a redfish. So if you haven't if you haven't been out for in salt water, uh, if you go down to Charleston, South Carolina, or down to Florida, you'll catch a lot of these redfish, and they're also called drum in some cases, right? Especially the big big ones. Um, Louisiana's got a lot of them, but the way the way you can tell a redfish is the full side on the back of the tail. So if, you know it's a, it's a it's a way to distract predators who might eat the redfish. They don't know which end the eye is really at, so the fish is swimming. And that ends up being a distraction. This was one of the uh, stripers that I caught over at Fletcher Boathouse um, on Sleeping Alley. And that's a sea trap. I think again down in Charleston. <coughs> and then that, that's a shed. And that's a northern pike down on the lower right hand side to get up to New York State and some of the other places up there in Minnesota, Michigan. Great fish to catch. So, um, and then that's a barracuda on the lower right. That's, this is actually a uh, this is actually a regular little rainbow trout. So this is out of Montana. It's about a seven pound rainbow trout on one of those little tiny flies, I mean, size 22 nymph, where the guy could see the fish. And so we we cast, and the fly, the fly would float by. We cast like three times. Then he changed the fly. We cast, float by, and finally he grabbed it. And you know it was like, Whoo! but uh, yeah, great. Uh, it would be a great fish. And then the barracuda are great fish to catch as well. They got up a wire, a wire leader. So I think that's it. So any questions? And you know, with that, we can actually go outside and do a little casting.